Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. You know, we mulled it over for about, I don't know, 10 days, what action we would have to take. And the conclusion we came to was at a minimum, we would have to ask Ken Schwaber to step down his chair from the board. Who is Tom Miller? Oh, I, that's a really good question. Um, I, nobody special. I, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time many years ago. I, I didn't know anything about agility or what was going on. I happened to have been promoted to a, a project manager in mm -hmm. my company. <laughs> and uh, I already knew the futility associated with being a project manager. You know, this idea that you were going to predict um, the schedule of something and, mm -hmm. you know, programming. And I was new to programming. I mean, I, I came from the business side and knew very little about technology when I transferred over to the technology field in my company. So I, I came into my company's IT department as a business analyst because I had told a person there, you know, I don't know anything about programming. I know very little about technical products. And they said, well, we can put you to work as a business analyst. And I didn't even really know what that was. But they said, you're really going to work with the business side to try to figure out what they need in products that we build. And they didn't use the per word products at the time. That's a, a term that we use now, but they used applications or systems. And I said, okay, so we, and they said, we call those requirements. So you'll gather these requirements that people need. And it sounded so easy, you know, just go talk to them and ask them what they want and then transfer that back to the programmers and the programmers build it and then we deliver it back to the business people and everybody's happy, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it seemed- that, to me, that always happens, right? Yeah, well, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, and it seemed to me that it was um, a bit of a, a, a type of manufacturing process, right? I mean, it had a, kin, a kinship to that to me in that you determined what you were going to build and then you went and built it and then you delivered it, and, you know, like building a house really, you know, and, um, and it was explained that way to me in our department that you know, it's, it's effectively like building a car. And about, uh, you know, I, I went through some pretty rigorous training as a business analyst, I thought, mm -hmm. many classes, and I mentored with people. But as I was developing an aptitude for that, and becoming familiar, familiar with the acumen and that sort of thing, I also started to detect sort of this underlying tension, you know, that um, maybe things don't always go as they think they're gonna go. And as I moved along in the process of becoming a business analyst, I quickly learned that things often don't go as you think they're gonna go. And it didn't take me long to figure out that's because there's a disconnection between what people want or what they think they want and what's delivered to them. And this mm -hmm. is back in 2001, 2002. And we had a very rigorous process <clears throat> that, we, that we followed. Uh, we actually used a, a, uh, a form of Cooper and Libran Summit D methodology. And it was, um, you know, brutally bureaucratic. Uh, the irony behind that, I, I later found out, was when Ken Schwaber and I were developing a working relationship and a mentoring relationship, I asked him mm -hmm. 
what were you building when you first started using Scrum? And he said, well, we were working for a client and we were actually automating some processing for Cooper's and Libran's Summit D methodology. <laughs> and I just exploded in laughter, you know, and he looked at me very strangely and he goes, why is that so funny? And I said, that happens to be the methodology we used at my company. <laughs> and he started laughing and he goes, oh, I feel for you. It was horrible and very, you know, bureaucratic. I, I don't know how else to describe it. So I had been a manager on the business side, stepped out of management, stepped into what we call an analyst position, a business analyst position. And then I was encouraged or enticed or coerced, however you want to characterize it. <laughs> You know, into, <laughs> you know, into becoming a project manager. And I had worked with project managers for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as soon as I got put in that hot seat, I, I you know, I was promoted. That's what they called it. I was uh, sentenced uh, to become a project manager. And as soon <laughs> as I got, you know, put into that hot seat, I, I immediately understood that they're often in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had mentors, of course, and I went through probably one of the most extensive and exhaustive training regiments in project management in private industry. Mm -hmm. I essentially went through mm, two years, the equivalent of two years of academic training in project management. Wow. Uh, 14 how much of how much of that did you use? How much What's of that? that did you? How much of that? Well, did you we end up were, using? yeah, we were expected to use. You know, we were so it was very defined, right? The yeah. processing was very defined, and we were expected to align our learning with the methodology. Mm -hmm. You know, and to and we had a, a methodology book. You've probably seen those, Milan. You know, you mm -hmm. flip them open, and they tell you exactly what you have to do. <laughs> the process manual. And um, we were expected not to deviate from that. And we were audited uh, to assure that we didn't. Or, you know, if we did, that we had, I guess you would call it the permissions to do that. And, uh, you know, so it, it was probably six months after I had become a project manager that I picked up uh, an old copy of... Um, Software Testing and Quality Assurance Magazine, STQA it was called. And okay. it's now called Sticky Minds. And uh, it's been around years and years, but it was laying on a coffee table in a room that I happened to be taking a break in. And so in the back of it was an article by a guy named Ken Schwaber, who was describing this process that he used it's probably a four or five page article. And the magazine was uh, maybe a year old. So I was probably reading it in November of 2003. And it was probably a, a late 2002 edition. So mm -hmm. I looked at the cover and I said, you know, this has been around a while because it was all, this magazine was already a year old. But at the bottom of the article, it said, if you want further information, uh, please email Ken Schwaber, you know, at, and it had the address down there. Uh -huh. So I emailed him, you know, I, I jumped on a computer and I said, this sounds fascinating. And I work at a huge company and I'd like to try it here. And, uh, you know, we're having trouble delivering things under the traditional way and we're expected to comply with all of the compliance sections of yeah. methodology. And I, and I said, I'd be interested in your opinion. And I don't have the email response, but I remember it struck me because he, he and I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, hi, Tom, you're either the dumbest person I've ever heard from or the craziest. <laughs> uh, either way, give me a call. And he put his, his uh, phone number down. Mm -hmm. So I picked up the phone and I called him immediately. And I said, hi, this is the 
dumb crazy guy that wrote you about you know using scrum at a big company and we talked for probably 45 minutes and basically mm -hmm. he did everything i think that he could do to convince me not to do it you know, he told me this is going to be dangerous for you um i'm sh you know we're i'm sure you have you're just loaded down with processes that you have to follow you probably have a rigorous compliance division. You probably even have a project management office, uh, you know, and he goes, look, all those things that these huge companies use to govern their software development is exactly opposite of what we do. And so, you know, I got to thinking and he, he it finally got to the point he goes look i i think if you use this there and you're caught you could get fired you know based on what uh. you told me <laughs> and i'm thinking fired for using this wow <laughs> <laughs> so i just paused and you know there was sort of you know one of those awkward silences and i finally said i'm going to do it anyway and he goes, okay. And he said, well, if by chance you get fired um, and you need a reference, I can probably pitch in one for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice of him. <laughs> yeah, the guy doesn't even know me and he's willing to you know, go out on a limb for me. So I said, okay. And then he said, if you try it, let me know how it goes for you, will you? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, I'll, 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 I got your email. I'll drop you a line. And we started keeping that connection open because mm -hmm. I tried it and it worked. I mean, I, I felt that it worked and we actually um, stunned some people at my organization because we delivered a program much faster than they anticipated without, you know, the deviation in quality that you would expect. Now mm -hmm. we did, I, I will say we did avoid or even circumvent some of the auditing procedures. And I had told my supervisor we were going to do that because they were demanding this system, you know, be delivered in a, a, a pretty short period of time. But we were also working for a vendor. You, you may know the vendor EDS, uh, yeah. the Ross Perot's old company. Yeah, no. And, you know, they had no idea anything about what we were doing uh, yeah. as far as the processing right mm -hmm. the, the process of building it they none of the nomenclature none of the nomenclature to any of the people i was working with was in any way familiar to them they were sort of reticent to use the the vernacular the the vocabulary because it it wasn't broadly understood and mm -hmm. interestingly it wasn't full of acronyms because all of these methodologies have does you gotta have the acronym yeah acronym exactly <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny when you use an acronym and then you look at somebody and you go do you know what that acronym actually spells out and mm -hmm. you know they're like no i don't know what i only know that it the acronym i don't know what the entire phrase is so anyway it worked and um i stayed in contact with schwaber and uh he actually started you know we started forming a, a relationship mentoring wise mm -hmm. um he was fascinated that i'd actually tried it in a fortune 50 company um i said i you know i didn't get fired obviously but i said i think there will be some challenges and problems with this because we're not culturally or organizationally set up to do this very well, you know, because his concept even back then was to have a, an encapsulated team, right? An autonomous mm -hmm. team back then, yeah. that was dedicated to that work. And he closely aligned uh, with the theory of constraints. Um, we talked about things like that a lot, you mm -hmm. know, he said, the reason we can't get things done in, in these organizations is people are 
multitask. They're working on way too many things at once. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, that's a problem we have. Yeah. He goes, if you just allowed people to be dedicated to work, you'd get that work done so much more efficiently and effectively that um, it would amaze them. But, but because their minds are married to this manufacturing mindset, they don't really want to do that with people. They think it's going to mm -hmm. actually, you know, slow work down. And they, you know, he asked me one time, he goes, you have way more work than you can do, don't you? I said, oh, God, of course. Always. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, they want us to cook all of the meals on the menu. And I said, we, bake, we can basically get to one side of the menu. You know, and he kind of laughed. Yeah. He goes, well, you're not in any. <laughs> you know, unique position. Uh, I mean, well, Ken liked you from the get-go. He even invited you to serve on the board of Scrum Alliance. Uh, how was that experience serving on the board? Yeah, I, you know, as we got to know each other, I had been involved in nonprofit boards since the 90s, in, in mm -hmm. the early 90s. And in passing conversation, I talked about that, you know, and, and I think that's what caused him to ask me to come on was mm -hmm. we'd already had one board member, a fellow named Steve Fram, and his dad was actually a university professor and had written several books on nonprofit governance. Mm -hmm. And so Steve made his way onto the board. Steve was uh, an aficionado of Scrum and had been, uh, I think I had been trained by Schwaber in it. But along the line of conversation, he discovered that Fram's father basically mm -hmm. was an expert in um, nonprofit board governance and working. So he asked Steve to come on. And Steve was a, you know, a, a startup entrepreneur in Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley was extremely bright and, uh, you know, very even keel emotionally and everything. So I think it worked out well for the board to have Steve on there. And mm -hmm. the other people that he had on the board were, you know, I, I would call them qualified professional level people. Mm -hmm. He had a vice president from Key Bank. Um, in fact, I was, when I looked around the, the board, you know, my first meeting, I'm thinking, if you really want to categorize people by level of position in their companies, I'm, I'm a peon, you know, I was a, uh -huh. I was a project manager and then, and then scrum master. I mean, I, I was sitting next to people who were startup entrepreneurs, a vice president of a you know, of, of development in a bank, a large, huge bank, you know, and he didn't really care about that. But to me, uh, it was sort of a little bit unnerving that, you know, and I, I, I think the thing I fell back on was I'd had many years of experience serving on nonprofit boards. Mm -hmm. and, and so what type of stuff did you guys talk things. about? Yeah, what was the, yeah. some of the challenges? So, you know, uh, from 2008 2010 and then he even asked you served as a chair of the board as well so um what are some of the like what do you, if you reflect back what are some of the biggest decisions challenges that you guys challenges that you had to deal with just in general like yeah. as a board so there was you know this is so in nonprofits the board is responsible for acting in a fiduciary capacity to manage the you know, the financial functions and the operational functions of the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And there are certain state and even federal laws, you know, like we have to, we have to uh, publish a 990 tax form, you know, and there's quite a bit of leeway about w whether you can make money in a nonprofit. And that's been a discussion in you know, associated groups that you and I belong to for many years, mm -hmm. you know, what's too much money. And um, those are called reserves. And, you know, it's, it, it's not unusual for nonprofits to have large cash reserves. And mm -hmm. 
Um, the, the interesting thing about this nonprofit was it did not have a, what I call a fundraising division. In other words, like if you look at the Red Cross or nonprofits like that, they typically have a fundraising division, you know, that goes mm -hmm. out and solicits contributions, uh, donations, uh, things like that. Here we didn't have that because we had a fairly steady supply of income through certification fees that were coming in because we were providing a, at that time a unique certification and it was highly in demand. And so we didn't have to go out and uh, solicit money from anybody. We didn't have to solicit contributions. We didn't have to give financing for things. We just had a steady cash flow into the business. And the thing was, is when you look at our operations, we had very little in expense. You know, we didn't own a building. Uh, we did all of our staff was contracted staff at the time. We had, I think, three employees. You know, so when you looked at those kinds of things, we were really in a very unique position and an enviable position for many nonprofits. You know, we were cash rich and getting richer, and we were expense. Um, we had strong expense management there because we just mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of expenses. And that, you know, so really the, the problem with serving on this board was many of the people on the board didn't really know how to function on a board. Mm -hmm. um, the bylaws were not always clear as to the specific duties. They were pretty generalized. Mm -hmm. um, and the chair of the board, Schwaber, was intimately involved in the operations. You hardly ever see that. Um, typically, mm -hmm. you try to keep an arm's length distance from operations. I mean, yeah. you usually have a director or somebody that reports to you, yeah. right? And then you stay out of their business you manage his performance. Um, we, we typically reviewed performance twice a year and there was a, I wasn't on that committee, but there was a committee that, you know, yeah. reviewed. And Jim Cundiff, when I was on the board, Jim Cundiff was the managing director. And Jim had come from the uh, Indianapolis chapter of the American Red Cross. And he was a certified um, nonprofit executive. So, I mean, he, he was a very capable, competent director. I mean, he knew how to handle the, the, the deal. And these directors know the political fraud that's inside these organizations. There's always politicization of what's going on. But it was, um, it was paramount in this organization. And the, really the politics of it stemmed from the fact that the found, one of the founders of the organization was so intimately involved in the management of the organization. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, basically kind of did not believe he could make a move, I would say a strategic move um, or even a tactical move in support of any kind of strategy we had without getting the blessing of Schwaber. Yeah. You know, that's, that was, and we on the board were somewhat oblivious to that. I mean, mm -hmm. We functioned, I think, as a typical board functions. We went through an agenda at our meetings, yeah. talked about finances, um, looked at strategy, uh, but we really didn't have a lot of, stri uh, of strategic thought because this growth of certifications was growing exponentially. It was yeah. great. It was crazy. Yeah. Oh, God. And, you know, at $50 a pop, and sometimes they were, they were certifying 10,000 people a month, Milan. Wow. So think about <laughs> you know, 10,000 people a month times $50 is $500,000. And, and that wasn't every month, you know, yeah, yeah, but but it was, it was steadily increasing to the point where that was going to be the norm. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I, I remember having a conversation with Steve Fram around our concern about, are we going to get to the point where, you know, we basically have so much money that we're going to draw unnecessary attention from the Internal Revenue Service. Mm. And so we had a treasurer, you know, and he said, yeah. you know, not really, because as long as we're not profiting, in other words, no person is profiting from it, mm -hmm. the institution, the organization can basically hold in reserves a lot of capital, mm -hmm. you know, um, you can call it, you know, like we called it reserves, but, you know, and, and <laughs> you know, like he said, um, uh, Dan Hintz, he was the treasurer. He goes, like, like Dan said, you know, he goes, look, what happens if the economy suddenly takes a big dive and, and this starts to dry up? Yeah. Uh, we still have ongoing fixed expenses, granted, not a lot, but some. Yeah. So what happens? Uh, 2010 rolls around. You as a uh, board member and uh, have to get Ken or you ask Ken to leave or what well, led to that? And what yeah, are some that things that you could share? That uh, was September of 2009. And I can't, you know, I, I can't really go into the minute details of that. We, yeah. we found some problems. Well, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say we found problems. Problems were brought to my attention specifically by some people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, it doesn't matter who it was. It was somebody with knowledge, obviously. And so we, we, I was at a conference in Denver and I got this information and I'm thinking, wow, this, this sounds peculiar, you know? Yeah. And so I called some other board members and I said, maybe we should get together and talk about this. You know, I, I think I emailed them and I might have mm -hmm. called a couple of them and I said, Let's get together and find out, or at least figure out what's going on here. And we did. So we got together and I happened to be in Denver with a couple of other certified scrum trainers, a guy named Lowell Lindstrom, who later became the interim managing director of the Scrum Alliance for a while, and a lady named Michelle Slager. And Michelle and, and Lowell and I were putting on a presentation at this insurance conference about agility and scrum. Because, you know, most of the people there, this is 2008, most of the people there was not, were not familiar with the concepts or anything. So we were gonna have them do some fun things and, you know, just introduce the concepts to them. So they weren't really involved in anything. They weren't involved in anything, except that I had to tell them I've got some Scrum Alliance business I need to tend to here and there. And we were only had one session. So they, I, we did our session and that was that. Um, but we had some meetings that we, we actually got together on a conference call while I was there. The person who had the information explained what had happened. And I remember thinking and I wasn't the only one that the what the information now suggests that some impropriety had taken place and we you know we molded over for about I don't know 10 days what action we would have to take and the conclusion we came to was at a minimum, we would have to ask Ken Schwaber to step down his chair from the board. Because to us, the, the circumstances presented a clear conflict of interest of, for his service on the board. And we were all in agreement of that, you know? So, well, I guess there's sort of an irony here, but Schwaber was supposed to come to my company and, and speak. And I got a call from his wife, Christine. And this is after I got back from Denver. So I got a call from Christine and she says, Ken is not going to be able to make it to your meeting. 
he's been in a serious accident with his bike and a car. He was riding his recumbent bike and it collided with a car. And I said, is he hospitalized? And she said, yes, he's hospitalized. So he was in the hospital in Boston. Um, we continued to have discussions and it basically came down to, uh, we agree he's got to leave. Uh, we need to tell him that we need to get mm -hmm. the best way is to get his agreement to leave his, his voluntary, uh, leaving that that's what we thought. And so, you know, they said, you're the rest of the board said, you're probably closest to him, Tom, why don't you facilitate the discussion? Meaning why don't you talk to him, you know? And gosh, we called him and he was in the hospital. <laughs> And he, uh, he and Chris, his wife was there, and he he wasn't really reluctant about stepping down, but he immediately wanted to negotiate. And one of the things he wanted to negotiate is he wanted to keep authority over a new program that he was developing with Microsoft called the Certified Scrum Developer Program. Okay. Right, so he wanted to retain, for lack of a better word, ownership of that. And I was sitting in my uh, company space, right? Everybody, this was on a conference call. So I couldn't see the other people, the other board members, but I was thinking to myself, no, no, that's not going to happen. So I just spoke up and I said, we're not going to do that, Ken. We're not going, you know, when you step off of the board, um, the board and the operations management, meaning Jim Cundiff, will take over all ongoing strategic initiatives, basically is what I said. And he didn't like that, of course, right? So. I, uh, the phone call ended with his resignation. I wanted it in writing, but he was in the hospital. So I said, I'll, I'll follow up with an email to you and I'll confirm that you're resigning from the board of directors of the Scrum Alliance effective at 5 p.m. Eastern time today. And whatever date that was, you know, September 17th or whatever it was, 2009. So I did that and I didn't get a response. So that was notice enough for us. Yeah. You know, so he's off. And then it was about, I don't know, you know, there was, of course, the news of his departure from the board spread like wildfire through the organization. There was no way you were going to, we we're going to keep that from getting keep that. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. that wasn't going to happen. And so I immediately began fielding inquiries and questions. And what about this? What about that? And no, you know, mm -hmm. okay. And we can manage that. I mean, that was to be expected. But then I got a call from Steve Fram. I, I think we had our meeting on Wednesday with Schwaber. And Friday, late Friday morning, maybe early Friday afternoon, because I was in central time and Fram's on the East on West coast time. He goes, I want you to enter this URL into your browser and I want you to look at it. And the URL was www.scrum.org. And I put it in and I you know, was shocked. And I'm like, what? And Steve's on the phone. I go, what is this? And he goes, welcome to Ken Schwaber's new business. And so I'm, you know, navigating through the thing and it's obvious that it's a training business. Yeah. And it's obvious to us. And in fact, he's already announced <laughs> certifications. And I incredulously tell Fram, who laughed at me, I said, he can't do that. He's a certified scrub trainer. That's against <laughs> the contract. And I can remember Fram effectively telling me, do you think he gives a damn, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
obviously and that not, made right? me even <laughs> angrier you know yeah. you know so so that put into process uh, a lengthy cease and desist um I'll call it a process, you know, it, 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 yeah. there were letters sent, you're in violation of your contract as a certified scrum trainer, you cannot mm -hmm. represent competing organizations, blah, blah, blah. Never heard a word back from him, Milan. Never heard anything. The only thing I heard was he had posted, well, he'd sent me one email reply and it said, et tu, Brute? That was the only thing it said, you know, obviously inferring that my allegiance and loyalty to him to had him, been yeah. completely violated. Right. Yeah. But he, uh, you know, he condemned me publicly, uh, called me a neophyte, said I had no business even being in the organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is coming from a guy who didn't, you know, didn't beg me to come on, but you yeah. know, pretty insistently asked that asked, I'm yeah. board. You know, and he and liked you too, me, so he probably felt betrayed, right? Oh, uh, he, he felt horribly betrayed, of course, he did. Yeah, uh, yeah. but you had to do, I mean, uh, what was going through your head? Obviously, you had a conflict too, you know, you had a good relationship with him, but you also wanted to do what's right, uh, right? I, I didn't, I had to sacrifice, I knew I had to sacrifice our relationship because mm -hmm. my duty as a board member, specifically, you know, uh, called out in the bylaws. Yeah, was it was clear to me. I mean, I in fact, you know, my I guess my only regret looking back is that I thought we should have taken more serious action, mm -hmm. and I did not support that at the time. Yeah, I didn't, and I, you know, that kind of sits crossways with me sometimes. Yeah. Because I, you know, I thought what he did was egregious enough that it, that there should have been more done than just asking him to leave the board. Yeah. You know, but if I you thought, look at, if you look at, you know, with some, you know, with, with good, there's bad, with bad, there's good. Right. Yeah. None of us would be where we are if you take Ken out of the scrum picture. Oh, absolutely not, right? Right. Yeah. So like more than anybody else, I think even, you know, what he did and his uh, personality, his, you know, we would not be where we are, you, you know, yeah. uh, scrum wouldn't be agile probably for that, the moment wouldn't be what it is and what has become uh, without Ken, so. What are some of the things, if you reflect back, like what are some of the things that you, you know uh, you really appreciate about Ken? Um, that that uh, things that you know uh, maybe, yeah, maybe well, proud to be his friend, maybe proud to like just like hey, I'm associated with this guy. That's yeah, you know sometimes he's <laughs> you yeah, know, I you know going like, crazy think, with things and sometimes <laughs> I think pride is a, a little bit of a a strong statement. I, I would yeah. say that I felt indebted to him. Um, I mean, he really went out of his way to mentor me, I think more mm -hmm. so than he did other people. I don't know, because my relationship was quite personal with him. And we didn't really talk about what his relationship was with other people. You know, whether he was helping other people or tutoring them or mentoring them, however you want to characterize it. I know he was quite close to Mike Cohn because yeah. they trained a lot together and they actually started the Scrum Alliance together. So um, he, but his relationship with Cohn was more uh, professional. That's, yeah. that's what I thought. You know, they, they trained together um, and they were they were friendly and continued to be even after Schwaber left the board and mm -hmm. left the uh, Scrum Alliance. They continued to remain in contact. In fact, lots of the information that I got about how Ken was doing and things like that came from mm -hmm. mine. Yeah. You know, because I Ken would not respond to me. I reached out to him probably about six months ago by email just to yeah. see. Never heard anything back. So, and I think it really stuck in his craw 
what? what would you tell him um, if he did pick up? Uh, I don't know. I would, uh, you know, I my intentions would be to repair uh, a relationship that went sour 10 years ago, over mm-hmm. 10 years ago. Um, I remember I ran into Sutherland at an Agile conference and he kind of jokingly said, you should come to the coffee shop in Lexington. <laughs> they both live. And, and I know. I, I, uh... with us. <laughs> and I said, it would be interesting if I walked through the door, uh, what would happen? You know, and he kind of Lexington is a dear place to me too, because that's where I uh, learned about Agile. I went to school in Rhode Island and uh, Lexington is a sh- trip between uh, Providence and Boston, where all the big right. companies were. Yeah. Uh, so uh, more known for its revolutionary war history than anything <laughs> they just both uh, happened to live in that area and they meet in lexington to have coffee uh, so one time i was out at an agile games conference in boston and i drove by his house uh, you know i just wanted to see you know I, I don't know for posterity i guess i just drove mm-hmm. by and looked and the lights were on and i'm thinking you know i don't have the nerve to stop and i don't think it would even be appropriate to stop uh, but you know here I am, you know, probably within a hundred feet of him, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk to him, you know. And he, you know, he he taught me a lot. In fact, people will tell you when they take my classes and when I interact with other people, I can recall conversations I've had with him. At least my recollections of them very vividly. Mm-hmm. Things that he told me, things that he uh, instilled in me, mm-hmm. you know, and. Um, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll never forget that. He, uh, I, I once called Tim to his face, a mystical. I said, you know, people see you as mystical. And he kind of laughed and he goes, what, what the hell do you mean by that? And I said, I don't know. You sort of mesmerized them. And yeah. the, the, the biggest, I, I mean, bar none, the, the biggest time I ever saw that happen was in Minneapolis at a scrum gathering. We were in the closing circle. So this is back in 2007, I guess. Is this when you had to have two circles instead of one and people are no, freaking out? No, no, this out? was, I'll, I'll explain to you. So we're, we're in the closing <laughs> circle because Esther Derby yeah. and Diana Larson were there facilitating. And, uh, you know, Esther had had a falling out with Ken over, you know, whether the Scrum Alliance should be nonprofit or should be for profit. Esther was quite insistent it'd be nonprofit. And then she eventually bailed out of it. Um, and she won over. Uh, she basically, Mike sided with her and said, we should, we should keep it nonprofit. And of course, Diana was there. And I don't know what kind of relationship Diana had with Ken. Ken, Ken could be, you know, Ken, off, he often had precarious relationships with people that had big names in the, in the movement. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, off and on kind of relationships. And it wasn't for me to pry and I didn't get in the middle of them. But anyway, he, for some reason, he was not at the closing circle. He was actually at the, in the bar of the hotel. And at this scrum gathering, we had, uh, I want to say exactly 70 attendees. Now, I might be off a few, but that's just the number that comes in my mind. There were 70 there. And, um, and there was a big row uh, over this notion that 70 people was way too many to have at a gathering, that there's no way, and we certainly should never have more than 70 at a gathering. And it was getting pretty tumultuous in the, in the room about this. Uh, some people were like, well, wait a minute, we're a growing community. Don't you think we would expect to have, you know, more people and other people would go, we're going to ruin it. You know, we're going to, it's just going to be overrun. And then pretty soon we're into one of these big conferences and blah, blah, blah. And it was, just, so I went up for grabs and I left the, I left the room and I went and I found him and he doesn't drink he was having a coke you know he's yeah. he's not a drinker and so i said i think you need to come into the room and he looks up at me you know he's got the straw the coke in his mouth and he goes he doesn't even take the straw out. he goes why <laughs> you know? 
And I said, because there's a, a big argument going on about whether 70 people at a scrum gathering is too many people. Mm -hmm. And all he said was, oh, dear. <laughs> he gets up, doesn't say a word to me. He just gets up and walks away. And he walks towards the, the room, the hotel. I, I guess you call it a conference room or whatever, right? And so I just get up and follow behind him. And he walks into the room and you would have sworn that the Messiah had walked into the room. Honestly, the whole place just went immediately dead quiet. You could hear a pin drop on the carpet in there. And he went into this sort of soliloquy about, you know, think about it. We're trying to grow a movement here. We're trying to embrace people's entrance into our community. We're trying to help people gain traction with this, blah, blah, blah. And it went on. And I remember he got to the end and I'm thinking they're, they're in a trance, Milan. They're in a trance. <laughs> you know, he's got them in a trance. <laughs> and he goes, who knows? Someday maybe we'll have 150 at a gathering. Maybe even 200. 100. <laughs> and, it's, and you can hear some of the gasps in the room like, oh. oh you know, and he goes, wherever it ends up, let's, let's be a community. Let's help people understand and embrace what we're doing here. And with that, that was it. That was, and everybody was happy. You would have thought we all drank the Kool-Aid. And I was like, and I, I can remember I was standing at the door thinking to myself, my God, I have just seen a deity completely entrance his followers. <laughs> I really have. <laughs> and uh -huh. I don't know. I'm sure Diana and uh, and Esther were sort of standing back going, oh boy. <laughs> you know, you know. But uh -huh. that's the kind of belief that people had in him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... It was surreal in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, it was, I, I, you know, I have, I've had people ask me, was it cult like, and I go, no, because in cults, basically there's evil, you know, in those, yeah. I mean, they, yeah. like, if you think of Jim Jones, when he had the cult down in Guyana, mm -hmm. you know, most people all ended up committing suicide. I mean, this was not a cult because I didn't see it as nefarious or as evil mm -hmm. you know i just saw it as people really uh sort of like the minions you know attached here yeah. to, to the god you know and anyway no uh, that's really interesting um uh, what was uh like for jeff sutherland during this time i know he was cio at a company uh around this time right uh he got involved maybe around 2010 when did jeff yeah uh, no jeff was involved early here's the deal with jeff jeff yeah. so if you go back this is schwaber's telling to me that yeah. I remember. when they went back when schwaber said you know we need to get scrum out in the public and he said that sutherland's attitude was if if that's what you want to do fine i've got things to do but and it, he you know uh, that's not a quote that's just yeah. how it came across jeff yeah. was about doing jeff's thing mm -hmm. and that was you know one making money which you don't blame the guy for that but two yeah. it was you know, helping companies he was associated with um, deliver products faster, better, you know, and that's what he saw here. He did not see his position as being any kind of altruistic one, you know, where mm -hmm. I need to get this out to the rest of the world to save the world. That yeah. He could care less whether anyone else used Scrum. And this yeah. is in 94, 95. You know, so Schwaber's the one that presented the paper on Scrum at Uppsala, yeah. you know, the <laughs> programming conference. He, Sutherland, as I recall, Sutherland really wasn't involved with that. Yeah. 
And Sutherland wasn't involved with the creation of the Scrum Alliance. I don't think he was even involved with the creation of the Agile Alliance, although I may be wrong about that. He had signed the manifesto. Yeah. So, um, but he did that, I think, because he wanted a voice in having Scrum be part of that voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but, I was talking to Mike Cohn, and he said, you know, well, I didn't know this, but he said the, that uh, Scrum Alliance came out of a program uh, within Agile Alliance. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, which was interesting. I, I don't think many people know that. Yeah. Uh, In fact, that's how Esther and Mike and, and Ken got together because it yeah. grew out of, they were members of the Agile Alliance. Mm -hmm. And it grew out. I, the, the inspiration of it was Schwaber. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, in the Agile Alliance at the time, it was really an infant organization trying to find its way. And my sense was, this was never told to me, but my sense from talking with Schwaber was, Schwaber was not going to have an influential position with that organization. In other mm -hmm. words, if he started his own and got some buy-in for that, he would be able to guide that in that organization the way that he wanted it, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why, and, you know, sort of, I won't call it the dark side of Ken, but this is the side of Ken that was probably fought by Esther is Ken yeah. could probably see some money here, mm -hmm. right? And it was, it did not, it only made us laugh that scrum.org is a for-profit organization, even though it has .org <laughs> you know, in the URL. Yeah. We laughed at that so hard. Uh, I can remember Dan Hintz going, oh boy, he's just taking it to the extreme. He's put uh, you know, the typical handle on the URL that you would see for a nonprofit. Nonprofit, it's yeah. Fully profit. <laughs> <laughs> that is i haven't thought about that but that's that's a really good observation uh oh yeah yeah that irony hit us like uh bricks in the face man we were like uh, oh my god he's playing it for all it's got you know uh, and i you know it one of the things we never took away from the man was his shrewdness and his intelligence mm -hmm. and he had probably what most people would deem a, a fairly balanced combination of those two things he was mm -hmm. relatively shrewd and he was also quite bright mm -hmm. and you had to sort of understand when he was being shrewd and when he wasn't uh -huh. you know so yeah and so sutherland never he was never really interested in the Scrum Alliance. The, the only, his only interest was money. Yeah. And as soon as the certification, which just drove Esther crazy, Esther Derby crazy, it drove her crazy, that somebody would pay for a certification that was effectively meaningless, <laughs> you know? yeah. that, that showed no competence, that had no way of uh, assessing knowledge. We didn't even have a test, Milan. Uh, <laughs> we basically just got blessed at the end of the class. And you you felt really good. And uh, yeah. you know, you you boasted and you go, I'm a certified scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> What's that mean you can do? I don't know, but I'm a certified scrum. But it was a good timing. It was a good timing though, because at that time. Uh, I mean, not that it's now any different, but certifications were a big thing, right? Uh, well, so they were starting to emerge. I actually yeah. chalk it up to Schwaber as driving the certification process even more. So PM, mm -hmm. PMP had been around a long time, and mm -hmm. it was the leading certification in the IT industry. Yeah. But there was I mean, no in any industry, like PMP and PMI, you know, what PMI did. And I remember getting my PMP back in the day. Right. <laughs> well, not back in the day, I guess it's 10, 11 years ago. So, right. uh, so in grand scheme of things, it's not. But it, it, it was a big deal. And the standard that PMI set, it's like uh, you you get respect from others, you know, when, when you get your PMP. And uh, 
uh, it was, uh, you know, something that PMI did, I think, really well to position it and to make it what it is. So, so I, I asked Schwaber, I said, so how did you come up with certified Scrum Master? Yeah. And he goes, well, he goes, we were starting to do the class and people that graduated wanted to know what, you know, what, what am, what am I? You know, uh, am I a certified scrummer? Am I a professional scrummer? What, what, you know, what am I? And he, I, I don't know the exact details of the deliberation. I think Cohn was involved with it maybe, but maybe not either. But I do remember Schwaber specific telling me that it was a thumb of the nose at PMI that they came up with CSM. Yeah. And he goes, you know, if PMI can have the PMP, we can have the CSM, you know, <laughs> we'll show them. Yeah. And I go, you know, I said, they've got, I don't know, there's 400,000 PMPs, Ken. Mm -hmm. And he goes, we'll have over 400,000 certified scrum masters, Tom. And I'm like, what? Which is crazy. Like I was looking at uh, uh, the report by Indeed last year and uh, certified Scrum Master overtook the PMP. It, he must have been laughing, but it's also like, you know, to have that vision and to, uh, it's, it's And of amazing. course, people love it when, when they laugh at your vision. And then later on, it's like, when I heard Jeff Bezos talk in 98 in Seattle and he goes, what, you know what our vision is for this company called Amazon? If you can sell it, you can sell it on Amazon. And <laughs> the whole group of about 150 people laughed at him. They all laughed at him. You can just him. think about what people could, you know, all the jokes <laughs> that you can come up with just after he said that. <laughs> I mean, I can remember sitting in the audience and a guy, a couple of seats down from me said, this guy is certifiably crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering how certifiably crazy is he now? He's crazy because he got divorced and gave his wife $36 billion. But, you know. but still, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, and I, you know, it's these kinds of entrepreneurs. I, I call Schwaber that. He had his, his company, ADM, Application mm -hmm. Development Methods, um, his company, ADM. In fact, Originally, the Scrum Alliance operated under the ADM moniker. Oh, really? Yeah, because it was, and that's when they had to basically separate it out and take it nonprofit and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he, when I say he was shrewd, um, you know, some of these things, you, you think the foresight of them is just remarkably brilliant, but sometimes it's just, you know, a throwing of the dart at the dartboard <laughs> yeah. and the thing sticks, you know, and you go, wow, it, it stuck, you know, it stuck. You know, I can remember being on the board and looking at, you know, all I can, all, I don't remember the numbers, but I remember the trend line going <laughs> crazy going up, yeah. and up, you know, like there was not going to be, and everybody would say, you know, we'd have a board meeting and they'd go, yeah, we're looking for it to level off. No, not leveling off you know it's just increasing at an increasing rate so so what do you think uh, based on where scrum alliance is today serving on the board uh how would you rate uh, what do you think where are things right now and uh well the is alliance it, is, is organizations it, yeah. yeah it's a mature organization now right so yeah. it's gone from developmental uh, it's even probably gone past cash cow and it's now okay. a mature business. It's a mature organization. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the problem with these kinds of organizations is what happens when your population of uh, potential purchasers starts to decrease either okay. due to competition or due to market penetration, you know, what happens? Yeah. And um, so in some ways, and, and some trainers would agree with this, they've been their own worst enemy because they kept putting more and more trainers out into the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people would say, let's say there's 300 trainers now. I don't know what the number is, but people would say in a world of 7 billion people, 7.5 billion people, 
you know, 200, 300 trainers is not very many. And even if you uh, reduce that population down to, let's just say, technology people, right? There's, there's probably, you know, two or 300 million technology people in the world. So have you really penetrated your market? I don't know. The, the problem is they haven't differentiated themselves very well. And I think Schwaber's organization has done that. Now Schwaber has stepped out of scrum.org's day-to-day management. I don't think he's doing all that well health-wise, but mm-hmm. he's, he's effectively turned it over. Um, and I think their current management is doing a good job of promoting it. And the other thing that I don't know for better or for worse, the uh, CST is now allowed to be a PSD, a professional scrum trainer. Mm-hmm. And I think- Or any for that matter, you can teach save classes, you can teach right. whatever you want. Yeah. So the branding has taken, I think the branding has taken a hit because it's not that exclusive anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. And anytime you're branding, it's like when Coca-Cola was an infant company and that was the big thing. And then all of a sudden Pepsi Cola comes along and RC yeah. Cola comes along, you know? And there's mm-hmm. now there's colas all over the place. Uh, Coke is still a dominant player because it's done a really good job of protecting its brand yeah. and promoting that. But, you know, it's, and the same thing could be said with beers. You know, it's Budweiser, king of beers, you know, blah, blah, blah. But now craft beers have taken a, a pinch. Plus the um, population, the market has changed. You don't have as many people drinking beer as you used to. So, and now people that, you know, the-, the Now people are doing the other uh, drugs and things like that, right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, comp- there's competing substances. <laughs> So if you yeah. legalize marijuana, you know, now I've got yeah. another thing that competes. With. You know? So, yeah. yeah. It, and so those kinds of things, I think, affect uh, the brand. But the this it's an unusual situation because it's stake, its largest stakeholder group, its most vocal one, most political one, is mm-hmm. its trainer group. That's the one with the most vested economic interest in the organization. And when it starts to feel pain, it becomes very vocal, Mm -hmm. you know? And um, there'll be people that drop out. You know, I'm probably gonna drop out in in the near future because I'm old enough now to where I don't wanna train like that anymore, but... Mm -hmm. You know, what happens to a person like you or even younger? I, you know, I'm mentoring people that want to become CSTs and they still have mm-hmm. many years left of working life. So what's going to happen with them? You know, they're and th- these things are going to evolve. They're going to ebb and flow, but it makes people uncomfortable, uneasy mm-hmm. about what's going to happen with their future because a lot of them have either heard or actually seen people like me make really good money off of this. And not just me, many of many of them, right? So if there's no doubt that this, that I was a huge beneficiary of this organization's economic model. Exactly. I think we all are. That's why I said, you know, we, as much, we've all been, and it's just not just, people that are associated with Scrum Alliance, but just in general, right. um, uh, it, it's created a whole new uh, set of opportunities for a lot of people that otherwise may or may have not, if I had to guess, probably not, but it's, uh, it, it's yeah, it's been very interesting uh, from that perspective. And I'm not sure, like, you, you know, uh, what would, I mean, what do you think is coming? If you look at, you know, next five years, uh, what do you think, what are some of the, obviously, you know, we can just guess, but what do you think is something that well, people might not be expecting? Here's what I, here's what I think is coming. Um, no. So, and you're seeing this, the, the pace of this increase rapidly. I mean, I've talked to friends that are still heavily involved in programming. So you're going to see no code programming taking over. Mm-hmm. You know, people won't be writing code anymore. So that's, that's the first thing you're going to see. 
So you're going to see the the longevity of uh, solutions shrink way down. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, it was long enough when we were doing it the old way, but now, and, and it's going to give you the opportunity to change things. You're also going to see systems become much simpler and less intertwined um, or coupled. Mm -hmm. Now, some companies are going to still have difficulty decoupling things. But as those companies start to fade out, like the company I work for, they've got highly coupled systems, but they're, they're either going to uncouple these things, decouple them, or they're going to go the way they're going to vanish. They're going to, yeah. you know, something's going to happen. But younger companies, companies that are more organically, uh, can more organically institute these kinds of changes are going to drastically affect the market. So I, I, there's still going to be processes that need, you know, that need to happen. Anytime you do work, you have processes in place. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, you know, I think what's going to happen is in the next 10 years, people are going to look back and they're going, remember that thing we called Agile? Remember that? And people go, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I read about it in a book. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know what's going to come along, but I think that the cultural manifestation of what we call agile now, and that's what I, you know, that's what I pushed for the last three mm -hmm. or four years, right? I don't think agile is a way of doing work. I think a, a agile is a way that organizations institutionalize themselves, how they're being, being agile, right, yeah. rather than doing, right. Yeah. And I think that's going to become archaic as well. People aren't going to say we're not, they're not going to say we're agile. They're going to say, yeah, this is what kind of culture do you have? I have, we have a really open, strong culture, mm -hmm. you know, or we, you know, we have a very organic culture, things like yeah. that. The, the sense that you're going to categorize it in these sort of dichotomized ways, like we do now, either like we, we, I, and I, I'm so tired of this. We're, you're either waterfall or you're agile, right? That, that's cool. <laughs> like binary yeah yeah in fact i i i'm not sure you may do this but i do this in my classes i go okay uh this is for uh, a full refund of the class identify where the term waterfall came from without researching just off the top of your head tell me where it came from and i've had people go winston royce and i go wrong i said winston royce uh, first described a process that was later called waterfall, but he mm -hmm. didn't call it waterfall. He called it sequential development. And it's actually a paper written in 1974 by a business analyst that coined the term waterfall, which was four years after Royce wrote his paper. And I have the paper. So I pull the paper out and, and look at it and they go, look right here, it says waterfall. And I have Royce's paper there and they're thumbing through it, you know. And I go, does it say waterfall anymore? No, but it shows this thing. And I go, you could call that the stair step process. It doesn't, yeah. you know? I mean, he doesn't call it anything except that he calls it sequential. Yeah. You know? Which waterfall sounds just so much better. Than <laughs> It sounds so nostalgic. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I go, you know, waterfall never described, should never have been used to describe a culture. What you're yeah. talking about is a traditional, unautonomous culture driven by, you know, traditional management. That's, that's yeah. what we're talking about, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, and I said, there's still a place in the world for defined sequential development. There is, and there's still, yeah. and there's always a place in the world for empirical based development, you know, mm -hmm. but an organization that we would call agile would, as I always say, would hand the problem to a group of people and go, here's the problem. Yeah. Go figure it out and solve <laughs> the problem as quickly and effectively as you can. And we'll support you. That's, that is what was the basis of the new, new product development game paper, right? In that paper, these autonomous teams were fully supported by management. Like, you know, what can we do for you? What, what is it that you need from us 
so that you can solve this problem. Problem, yeah. Because they put a time frame around the problem, typically 90 days. Mm -hmm. They go, we got to have a new printer in 90 days. We have to have a new concept vehicle in 90 days. That they get it out. Time, yeah. You know, so... And that's that's why Schwaber told me one time. He goes, he goes. I, I'm glad that they fight with each other over waterfall versus agile, but he goes, it it that isn't the fight, Tom. And I'm like, what's the fight, Ken? And he goes, the fight is, do you give people the authority and the autonomy to figure out how to do the problem because organically they will do that in the way that we describe. They will do it that way. And I'm like, wow. And he goes, absolutely. He goes, they only do it the other way because they're told and forced to do it the other way. But he goes, if you just gave them the freedom and the latitude to organize themselves and approach it how they should, which is exactly what we did in my organization. We just said, we're not telling you you have to use Scrum and we're not telling you you have to do any kind of defined process. We're not telling you you have to do that. We're telling you, you figure out how to do this. And what does your experience and your intelligence tell you about it? Mm -hmm. And we got things done a lot faster, Milan, and a lot better, right? And did we use Scrum? I don't really give a damn whether we did or didn't. You know, yeah, all I know just means to an end, right? In a sense, yeah. it's uh, it's about agility and having options rather than a, agility. Know, as Weber told me, is the ability to move omnidirection quickly. He goes, which is having options, right? In a sense, yeah. yeah. Goes, when you're in sports, you're agile because you can move quickly one direction or another, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's what an agile athlete does. When somebody goes, that guy's really agile, what they're saying is that guy can move, change directions on a dime, you know, whether he's dribbling a basketball or he's dribbling a football, you know, a soccer ball, anything like that. What, what, whatever he's doing, his agility suggests that he can move quickly in any direction that he wants without changing stride you know and that's mm -hmm. that's why and, and you see this is the shrewdness of ken schwaber coming out he thought fine i was like it just drives me crazy they're fighting he goes that shouldn't drive you crazy it should enlighten and please you <laughs> <laughs> and I, I you know here he's he's so you know he's a lot brighter than i am and i'm looking at him he goes think about it. the more they fight the more we stay out in the front right? If we were to change the world overnight and everybody was to suddenly do scrum, we would lose all the traction we ever had. But because we have resistance, it actually helps us. And he goes, that's why I condemn what they do, but I don't fight them. 